Welcome to another edition of Stretchers, Scandals, and Unsubstantiated Scuttlebutt, our series looking at uh, stories about Scripture. Not stories in Scripture, but stories about Scripture. The myths and legends and superstitions that have grown up around the characters that we've come to know and love. Now, our character for today is not quite as well known as some others, but uh, some of you may recognize him nonetheless. Uh, And our story today does not come from uh, myth or legend or superstition. It actually comes to us through archaeology. And it's quite fascinating. But before we get to that, we we need to take a moment to think about a a, a seemingly unrelated question. The, The question I want us to consider for just a moment is whether you've ever been concerned about jinxing something. Now, some of you right away know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you may be scratching your heads. But we have this thing that we do sometimes when uh, when things are going really well and we, we talk about it out loud. We get nervous that somehow by, by, by talking about things that are going well, we're going to cause them to go badly. So, for example, someone who maybe is prone to losing their keys would say, you know, I, I usually lose my keys all the time, but it's been, it's been weeks since I've mis- misplaced them. Oh, no, I hope I didn't just jinx it. Or another thing we'll do is we'll, we'll, uh, we'll say, knock on wood. And that has a whole other history behind it. But uh, we'll say, you know, I, I've been, been feeling pretty, pretty good and pretty healthy lately, knock on wood. As if by speaking those words, we are somehow inviting uh, bad luck. Or that our language can somehow alter reality. And we, we don't believe that by speaking these things, we're, we're changing the world around us. Not, we don't believe that scientifically. But there is this kind of superstitious part of us that believes we, we, we may be inviting bad luck by speaking about good things. And it turns out that that superstition, that strange belief, is actually very, very old. I mean, the notion that our language can, uh, can reshape reality is about as old as language itself. And that's where today's character comes in. You see... This notion of our language reshaping reality, it's, uh, it's really deeply held. And um, it, in fact, it's where we get some of these notions of, of magic words or, or spells or incantations. And uh, there was a, a, a figure from a thousand of years ago who claimed to have just that ability, who had the ability to, to speak words that would alter reality. A character who's known as the son of Beor. Now, some of you may recognize that name as someone who appears in Scripture, because he does. Uh, But he has a more famous name, and we'll get to that maybe next week. But so this famous character, the the son of Beor, claimed to have the ability to alter reality by speaking. And archaeologists, as they uh, did lots of different work in various places around the world, they they found this name, this uh, the son of Beor, the same name that appears in Scripture, they found in, in a number of different tablets and inscriptions. And they found that uh, the son of Beor claimed to have the ability to see into the council of the gods. Now, right away, as we're talking about gods, plural, you know this is not one of the uh, devout followers um, of, of the people of Israel. I mean, this is someone who's coming from outside uh, the, the, the Hebrew people and is talking about gods and goddesses that we would just probably refer to as pagan. But this son of Beor claimed that he could see into the divine council and was able to then speak in ways that could change the will of the council and could bring about blessings or curses. And uh, the story goes, as we take the bits and pieces we have from archaeology and uh, the the small uh, fractions of the stories we have in scripture, that this character became something of a of a mercenary or a sorcerer for hire who would speak words of blessing or curse uh, to go along with the will of the highest bidder and would use his uh, intimate knowledge of the counsel of the gods to give his, um, his employers the upper hand, perhaps even in battle. And as uh, our, our return to the archaeology, uh, as they started to look at these tablets and inscriptions, some of the gods and goddesses, some of the lines in these tablets, uh, seemed to, to hint or indicate um, uh, some of the darker sides of ancient religion, things uh, involving uh, sacrifice and death and violence. And so the son of Beor, as we find in this archaeological record, seems to be someone who's associated with very dark and dangerous things, a character who's to be taken very seriously, someone who's quite dangerous. But then he appears in Scripture, and the story doesn't go the way you might expect. But 
that is a story for another day.